Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Phillies Talk Podcast. I'm Jim Salisbury. Today, I'm joined by former Phillies player and general manager, current broadcaster, Ruben Amaro Jr. Going to wrap up those winter meetings. And uh, Ruben, Dave Dombrowski, a guy you have a lot of familiarity with in a lot of different cities. Um, man, he gets right after it. Um, they coming off uh, World Series appearance, come two wins shy, and they send a message to the entire baseball world, which I think we expected that they're there to stay there and they want to win this thing. Uh, they go out and they get Trey Turner. They get Taiwan Walker, that mid-level, mid-rotation starter. They're looking for a left-handed reliever as well. Matt Strom, I still think they're going to continue to tweak in that bullpen. But uh, give me your impressions on these winter meetings. What jumped out at you? Uh, I just love his, his aggressiveness. And David Dombrowski, uh, I know uh, I know a lot about him. I know the personality. Uh, he's got a little old school in him. I think he understands uh, the, the other parts of this game uh, well. But uh, I, I think you're absolutely right, Jim. I mean, he's trying to uh, jump on on the wagon, so to speak, um, as far as their club is concerned. And I know John Middleton's giving him the uh, the, you know, the the leash to be able to do that and the latitude. And uh, I think it's a great thing for the Phillies fans. Uh, the, the fact that they have a, a person in Dave Dombrowski who knows what it takes to put a winning team on, on the field. He knows the pieces that are necessary to do that. And he's a guy who's aggressively gone after them methodically. Uh, I love this. This is the, this is the kind of GMing that I, that I love to see the fact that he got a guy like Trey Turner, um, and, and, and to me, there were so many great uh, options at, at shortstop, just uh, just a, 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 all of them a, a tremendous different qualities and would would all have been uh, someone that, that would have helped this ball club. But he got the best one. And that's mm. what I'm about, man. And that, that, that's that's what I love about Dave Dabrowski. He got the best guy that was available because he is one of the elite players in the game in so many different ways. That's that's how you were doing this thing 10 or 12 years ago. You got, you know, in a trade, you got Roy Halladay. He was the best. You got Cliff Lee. He was the best on that free agent market that year. Um, you and Dombrowski have some similarities. You worked for him. I'm not sure if people realize this, but you worked right. for him when you were coaching in Boston. He was the their president of baseball ops. Did you get any inside looks at the way he operated and and that decisiveness and that aggressiveness? Absolutely. I mean, we've had some. We had some meetings during the season, uh, at critical times. We had some meetings uh, um, uh, at, in the, at the end of seasons. I mean, listen, uh, he he wants to win. That's what he's about. He's about putting together winning teams. There are a lot of GMs that want to want to look good, and they want to have a nice organization, and they and they want to like they want to present themselves well or intelligently. Dave Dombrowski wants to win baseball games and be a champion. And that's what you got to love as a Philly fan, which I am still, and uh, someone who uh, works with the team in, in, in some capacity, is that you want somebody who is going to be aggressive to try to do what's necessary to be a contender and to be a winner. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I love it. And we've had those meetings. I, I, he wasn't afraid to bring uh, Andrew Benatendi to the big leagues, uh, even though it may have not been quite his time. He was a young kid. He's ready to move him. That's why I don't think he's going to be afraid to move a guy like Painter to the big leagues if he's ready to go. Um, I think that he trusts guys who have done it before, who have who've got the track record. I mean, that's why you got the Kyle Schwarbers and the Castellanos, and, and now you have Trey Turner and Taiwan Walker. Um, he knows that there are pieces that he needed for his club, so he methodically went out and got it. He needed a shortstop. He got him, got the best one. Taiwan Walker was a quality mid-rotation guy, and I think that he went out and did what he needed to do. He did not want to give up too much as far as the uh, qualifying offer, as far as uh, the future of the franchise, but he did what he needed to do because he knew that he needed some depth in the rotation and someone to give uh, maybe Painter and Abel and some of those other guys who were coming along, give them a little time to develop and to add to the depth of their starting rotation, which was uh, vitally important. And, and then he got Strom, who's a left-hander who's who's going to help them in the bullpen. And I think he's going to continue, as you said, he's going to continue to try to add to that bullpen. But, uh, but I love the fact that he knows and identifies exactly what he needs. He tries to get the best guys that are available under, under the circumstance and he makes his move to get them. Yeah. I want to dive in on, on, especially on Turner here, but I, the point you make about, you know, getting a mid rotation guy in Taiwan Walker, 
Um, you know, he was a former first round pick, had some injury issues. A lot of times these guys, they come back from Tommy John, get a, get a year or two away from it. They really start to reach their uh, potential or, or their ceiling or, or have their best years. So, I mean, it looks like he, he's starting to put it together. And I like the signing. And I love the fact that they address their pitching depth, which I think, I think is absolutely crucial because you're going to start moving in Painter and Abel. And you can't just throw them. You can't just say, okay, go pitch 150 innings. you got to be careful. They're only at about 100 in their minor league um, season last year. I, I would expect maybe a 25-inning jump, 30-inning jump in 2023. You've got to be careful bringing those guys. They're going to need a, an extra day now and then. They're going to skip a start now and then. You're just going to have to be careful as they develop as, as young men and, and get their man strength and develop as pitchers. And also at the top, uh, Nola and Wheeler showed signs of fatigue this year. And, you know, one guy's going to turn 30, one guy's going to turn 33. Um, you've made the point here, and, and we have proof a month ago, that you can play well into the postseason, and the goal is to play way into the postseason. So you're going to need to have that rotation fresh. So th that pitching depth that they added, I think, is huge. And I love that, you know, they didn't give have to give up draft picks there uh, because I think you got a good scouting director in Brian Barber and, and – I, I like the work he's done. I want to give him resources to to kind of continue to do his job there. Um, so I, I like the I like the Walker signing a lot uh, in in terms of what he brings, and also just that depth and how I think it's going to impact the whole of the rotation. Um, but let's get back to Trey Turner. They're going to introduce him in Philadelphia on Thursday officially. We saw him a lot come through here with Washington. Um, he just impacts the game in so many ways. I, mean, I think he's a terrific defender. I hear that people say, oh, Correa's better. This guy's better. I think he's a terrific defender. He gets the balls. Um, he makes the play. He makes everything. And uh, I, I love the speed. I, I love the fact that he's a line drive hitter when he catches out front. He's got power. And it goes – how much better are they with this guy? What type of a difference maker is he? You've been watching him for years. Yeah, he's an elite baseball player. And you say I watched him for years. I got uh, I, I got had a little crush on him the very first time I saw him at uh, NC State. I had an opportunity to go and watch some of these uh, higher, higher round draft pick guys. We were actually focused in on Rodon at the time, uh, who was pitching in their rotation. And uh, Marty Wolliver at the time said, I take a good peek there at, uh, at Trey Turner. He's a pretty good looking player. And he only proceeded to have five hits. He had a triple down the left field line. He uh, uh, he hit a home run. Uh, he made all the plays at shortstop. There was some question at the time whether he's going to be a shortstop or they have to move him to the outfield. He was the one of the fastest players I think I'd ever seen ever. I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about just in a draft or amateur. I'm talking about the fastest guy. I've never seen anybody move like this. And that's the thing that he brings to the table: his athleticism, his durability. Um, he does so many different things, and you mentioned some of them, but his bat-to-ball skills are excellent. So you're talking about a guy who's got a little bit better bat-to-ball skills than even Gene Segura, who was probably the, one of the better guys on, in the lineup. Now, you don't have him anymore, but you have a bat-to-ball guy. He, 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 he can score runs by, uh, by, by creating runs, stealing bases, going first to third, going first to home. Um, he's got excellent range, which is going to be just essential in this day and age when you're talking about not being able to shift uh, as you as you were uh, allowed in the past, uh, there's so many different elements to his game uh, that that are just so important. And the fact that they got a winner, man, this guy two-time champion. I mean, this guy he's got rings, he gets it, and he understands what it takes to win. Uh, just a tremendous acquisition in so many different facets. He was the perfect uh, guy for for Dave Dombrowski to bring here. I love the effervescence he plays with, too. When I look at that kid, there's no doubt in my mind that there's no place else in the world he wants to be right now than on that ball field. He loves to play. Is that important yeah, in your mind? I think it's just huge. When you See, when, you, when you're signing and people talk about, oh, my God, this is a ton of money. Well, yeah, it is. It's a huge commitment by the Philadelphia Phillies. But you want to commit to guys who you believe are guys who breathe, live, eat the game of baseball. They play to win the game of baseball. They enjoy baseball. Bryce Harper, $300 million. He loves baseball. This is he, this is who he is. Uh, when you start giving, you know, even a guy like Wheeler, that they, they spend a lot of money. These are the kinds of guys you want because they 
They love the game. There are some guys that are out there you put money into and you're kind of you're leery because you just don't know if this is the right guy that I want to commit to. I thought it was very important to understand the makeup of the player when you're making this type of commitment that you know that that player wants to be a champion championship player and he and he lives, eats and breathes baseball. And I, I certainly think they got that with uh, with Trey Turner. They got it with Kyle Schwarber. I think that they thought that they got it with Castellanos. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's he's shown that yet. Um, and he certainly did not show it in, in this past year. Perhaps he grows to continue to love it. You saw him have a little bit of a change of attitude at the at the end of the year during the playoffs. So we'll see. We'll see about that. But when you're committing big dollars, you want to be able to commit those big dollars to people you know are going to give it to you day in and day out. And he is as durable as there is. Yeah, you mentioned – Schwarber, and they got it uh, with him, man. Um, you know, he, what a leader, uh, what a, a person. I mean, he's such an inclusive leader. The way he rallied some of those young kids, he didn't care if you're the 26th man on the team or the 29th man on the team. If you come out from AAA late in the season, man, he brought that group together uh, and then obviously delivered on the field. It's just, a, to me, a great, great signing uh, he was. And, they had a lot of intel on his makeup because, well, they had seen him. They played against him in the yeah. National League. But they had intel in, in, in Kevin Long, was his hitting coach, uh, for half a season in Washington, really kind of fell in love with him. He came on board last year, really pushed for them. You know, we need Kyle Schwarber, what he can do for the, on the field and off. And same thing with Trey Turner. Kevin Long, I know this is the Bryce Harper relationship. I think Kevin Long's relationship certainly equal. Uh, was his hitting coach in Washington, um, two cage rats, right? Three cage rats if you kind of put Bryce Harper in there. So they had real – I think Kevin Long was very impactful in, um, in in pushing for Trey Turner. And I'm sure Dave Dombrowski was too because I think we started hearing Trey Turner's name in June, right? When's the first time you heard it as a potential Philly? Yeah, I mean, I thought people were starting to banter that that name around a little bit because he was just seemed like to be the like the perfect fit, right? Um, and, and he really is. And 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 I think uh, this is something that we should not shy away from. The makeup of the team means something. And when you see the team bond the way it did at the end of the year, there's a lot of collective people that are involved there. Obviously, Kyle Schwarber is one of them, but Rob Thompson and his staff. I mean, those are guys that. Um, that you can't measure that. There's no way to quantify that. Um, it is something that is real. But if you have guys who um, buy in to the most important part of this, as far as the team is concerned, and it's to win, then you got something really special. We did it in 93. We had that in 08, 09, 11, all those years, 10. Um, we had those guys that, that their drive was to win baseball games. And I think that that is an invaluable part of it. And Dave Dombrowski does a heck of a job of understanding that and making that part of his decision making. Because if you talk, uh, if you listen to that press conference when they, when they first got uh, brought Kyle Schwarber in, talked a lot about his makeup. And uh, in this day and age, there's not a ton of GMs that are talking about that all that much as an important, real important element of winning. And that's certainly important to Dave Dombrowski. I agree, especially in this sport where you're around each other. You play six months of regular season games and seven weeks, six or seven weeks of spring training where you're playing games, you're around each other every day. I mean, you are in each other's grill all the time. You know, you oh, no, they, I mean, there's no question. I mean, you're literally – are living with these people. These are people you're living with for hours and hours and hours a day. And, uh, and, you know, I've been on some teams that have had unbelievable chemistry and I've had teams that had terrible chemistry. And guess what? The teams with unbelievable chemistry won and the ones with terrible chemistry, they lost. <laughs> and, uh, and that's reality. And, and uh, I, I know it's, you know, you, you like to play the game when it's fun and winning makes it fun. But when you have people who want to win, whose desire it is to win, uh, it makes the game pretty special and it makes your clubhouse and the entire, like, I, I don't know, I guess the whole atmosphere of being around that uh, is is just real special. And, and that desire to win starts at the top with, with John Middleton and his ownership group, Buck Family. They have written some, some very big checks here. Um, you know, I even go back, 
they, you know, it wasn't didn't turn out well, but Arietta got 75 million. Wheeler got 118 million. Then you get the Harper 330 million. And then you get Real Muto 140 here. Uh, a total of like 180 million for Castellanos and Schwarber. Now you got 300 million for um, Trey Turner, 70, was it uh, 75 million for or 72 million for uh, Taiwan Walker? I mean, they have written some big checks. Uh, it's a big market. Uh, they, they're, they're, you know, they're conducting themselves like a big market. And, you know, I think what we saw in October with the, the fan support and the eight sellouts, I mean, that, I think it resonates obviously with the free agents. They want to be part of it. Resonates with ownership as well saying we continue to put a winner out there. We're going to get the backing of the fans and it's all going to, it's all going to become part of our, our, our revenue cycle and we can afford to do these big things. I, I can't say uh, uh, enough about what the Buck family and the Middleton family have, have done as far as they've always, they're always very supportive of me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know that I was let go during the, during their, their ownership, but, uh, but the reality of it is that they, if they believe that there's a, a real reason to, to put the money in, they will absolutely do that. Um, I don't think it's an unlimited thing. I mean, we're not talking about the Yankees, uh, or the Dodgers, but we are talking about a mar large market team and they want to play like a large market team. And people talk about, well, this is a whole lot of money, man. You know, how do they go to do this? How do they sustain it? Well, guess what? They're trying to win. And if you want to be a big market player, you got to pay to play, baby. And you got to get in there. And listen, uh, I, I, I listen to some people talk about, you know, the length of the contracts and the, 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 the amount of money. First of all, it's not their money. Uh, it, it's, it's actually the owner's money. And as far as I'm concerned, if they're showing the fan base that they want to win and they're trying to get the best players and make those decisions to bring those players to this organization, that they should be lauded for it. I mean, there's no question in my mind that um, that John Middleton and Dave Dombrowski and uh, Jim Buck and their family, these people want to win. They're there to try to provide the, the fans with the best opportunity to win. Uh, to be a world champion, to be a National League champion, a world champion, a contender every year, and that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. Ruben, let me ask you, um, a lot of debate about where Trey Turner hits in this lineup. Um, where do you hit him? I got him in the one hole, Jim. I just uh, – and the, the beauty of, of what he brings to the table, though, is that he adds to a, 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 a lineup that basically – you can interchange a lot of different guys. Obviously, they had a great year with Kyle Schwarber leading off. Is he ideal leading off? Probably not. But he did a heck of a job in that area. Um, I, I, as a GM, I would not dictate to uh, to Rob Thompson. I say, hey, listen, you 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 make your decisions based on what you think is right for this ball club and most productive. But for me, because of his ability to run, because of the ability to to create, um, you know, uh, to create runs with his legs, I think, and his ability to make contact and get on base, I think that's a really critical part of what he brings to the table. And I think it's important to have him put it put him in in the one hole to do that doesn't have to be there uh, necessarily. It may be some matchups where, where you may flip-flop he and, and Schwarber. But I like lining going right, left, right, left in those first, uh, you know, first few hitters. And to me, it's, you know, it's, it's Turner, Schwarber. Then you go to Real Muto and, and, uh, and Harper, and you got a four, you know, left, right, you know, right, left. That's pretty, uh, pretty special at the top of your lineup. Tell me about the challenge that you believe it's going to be playing maybe as much as a half season without Bryce Harper. Well, it does create a challenge on a couple of fronts. Uh, one, um, obviously, you have to have Castellanos out there in right field. Um, and while he did improve some during the course of this year, I mean, he's, you know, you're talking about two guys in their corners who just as far as uh, overall – ability to cover ground it's not that great they just don't move all that well they're not they're not they're not speedy outfitters you're not talking about victorino and uh worth you know or or those, those types of players so um so marsh is going to have you know, have his challenges out there in center field that said um i i do think that they can fill in with some people that 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 will help him and will help this lineup obviously having turner at the top of the lineup uh as opposed to someone else uh, being at the top of the lineup, I mean, would it either have been Didi Gregorius as a shortstop or Bryson Stott, who I think is going to move now to second base. Now you have a guy at the top of the lineup who is a, you know, a, a, 
you know, you're talking about an immediate MVP type player. Um, and so you, you won't lose a ton. Obviously you want to have uh, Bryce Harper in your lineup every single day and it will be a big loss, but they did play great baseball without him in there. Um, when you, when you think about when they got hot, they got hot when Bryce Harper was not necessarily in that lineup and, uh, and put themselves on the map. Now, Bryce Harper, one of the best hitters in all baseball, um, and certainly a guy that they need in this lineup. But I have a strange feeling that this guy is going to come a little bit earlier than, than they're saying as far as being in the lineup. I think he may, he may be closer to May than July um, as far as him being in the lineup and being able to produce for them. Yeah, you mentioned uh, how, how well they played when he was out there with 32 and 20 in his absence. So it's pretty Not good. Bad. Yeah, I mean, and that's what a good team does. And they, they, they absorb a big loss and they rise to the occasion. They certainly did that. But you always want to have him in there. And I, I agree with you. I think All Star Breaks a conservative estimate. And if I was, you know, running the Phillies, I'd have a conservative estimate too. You always keep the expectation down and have him beat those. Um, Eat that estimate, and everybody looks good. But he'll be he'll be champing at the bit to come back. He will not do anything stupid. He knows his body. But uh, from everything I heard, uh, it was a very good repair job, and, and they think it's going to uh, heal up well. And he should be swinging in anger, whether whether or not that's live BP, whether that's the high velo machine in the in the cage whether that's minor league get bats, but swinging in anger sometime around mid-May. And I think once you're doing that, you can, like, hit the stopwatch and say, okay, spring training spring training starts for this guy. Maybe that's four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. So who knows that Otani seven-month uh, return to a DH from a Tommy John surgery is sort of the roadmap. But Bryce Harper, man, he's – He's different. He, he could He's just, a special guy. And I, I honestly believe this. I think that certain guys heal differently and get back differently. I think the most important part of this is, and I learned this when uh, we were trying to rehab Jim Tomey and some others, it's about his legs and the, 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 his ability, because he did not have any surgeries on his lower half, he's going to be able to get his legs in shape. And that's a vitally important part of getting him back and getting him ready uh, on the offensive side of the board, because it's your base, your lower half that has to be ready. If you have a strong lower half, that'll ease a lot of things. Um, even with that bad elbow all year last year, I mean, the man produced very, very well. Um, it's obvious that we need him in the outfield, and, and that's why they did the, the, the surgery. Um, and it probably could have continued to play in his career um, because he's so strong in his lower half. He could have con continued to be a DH, but I, I know it's very, very vitally important for him to be in the outfield. Um, he's become at least an average defender now, and I think that's that's important for the lineup as a whole. That's great insight about the legs, the base, the foundation. It's important in everything you do. Uh, before this podcast loses its legs, Ruben, what do you think? What do you think is next? I mean, he checked off a bunch of items at the at the winter meetings. He sure did. Um, where, do you, where do you see Dave Dombrowski and Sam Folds um, going next to try to make those final tweaks to improve their ball club? I think they're going to continue to assess what they have on their bench and in their bullpen. I think uh, it's – to me, Jim, it's always about pitching, 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 and then after that you try to get more pitching. Because uh, – and, and this is why this Taiwan Walker – uh, signing was so important um, th to create the kind of depth that was necessary. As you said, uh, you can never have enough depth in pitching and, and you're probably going to go through 10, 12, maybe 15 starting pitchers at some point during the course of the year um, if you're lucky. And so uh, that's why Taiwan Walker is so important. I think you'll continue to see them can uh, try to, they still have an open spot for that fifth spot. So that, so they may very well bring in, you know, sort of a veteran six, six year free agent or someone like that, um, or someone who could pitch in long relief or someone who can mix, mix and match um, in the bullpen somehow. Uh, and, and I think they're going to, he's going to continue to try to tweak their heavy lifting, so to speak, is probably over. Um, but I think that there are some things that you could do on the bench. There's some versatility you could create um, and, and some competition to create. Uh, you just don't want to hand guys like Matt Veerling a job. I mean, he's got options. You can still bounce them around. You want to give guys – you want to make guys hungry to, to, uh, to, to have opportunities to be there. A uh, guy like Derek Hall, can he, can he be a guy that, could, that can help out in some way, shape, or form? Do you want a little vers more versatility out of that guy? Um, 
you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go, but I think that he's going to continue to try to create some depth. Uh, someone's going to have to DH. Someone's going to have to play some of the outfield. I think that's one of the reasons why the kid Cave was taken off of waivers. Perhaps he can create um, a little bit of depth in the outfield for them, or w- w- along with a guy like Veerling, et cetera. Um, but I think Dave Dombrowski can whatever, whatever, whatever he can possibly do to continue to tweak that team. The bullpen is still an issue. I think there's, there's guys in the back end. I think they do have some quality in the back end there. But if they can create uh, a little bit more depth there as well, uh, along with the, the acquisition of Strom, I think that they'll continue to try to do that. And one thing about the bullpen, you know, we, we focus so much attention on roster construction, and we focus our attention on, on the offseason and the quote-unquote hot stove. You can keep churning that bullpen in April, May, June, right up until the trade deadline, July. So, the, you know, the, the – you know, the eight or ten, eight guys you start with, you know, they you might turn that thing halfway over by by the time the pennant race really begins on, you know, August 1st when that trade deadline comes. And that's something you used to do all the time. And I'm sure that's something Dave Dombrowski will continue to do. Um, exciting yeah, time. No question, no yeah. question about it. You're right about that, Jim. And and you know what? You, you create that by having flexibility. And, and some of the guys that they have on their roster – you know, it's that option. You can bounce them back and forth and kind of utilize them as you will. Well, these are exciting times. Phillies, uh, like we said, checked off three pretty big items. There'll probably be some smaller stuff, and uh, we'll have all those details for you as the winter moves on here on the Phillies Talk Podcast. Ruben, thank you for joining us. Happy holidays. We will catch everybody next time.